Hello, everyone. Jim Collison. I'm here with Danny Lee today. We're talking a little bit about improving teamwork uh, in a, in a in a hybrid environment, and and I think very uh, very appropriate conversation to have today. Hey, Danny. Welcome to our time together. Hi. Good morning, Jim. Pleasure we, to be here. We've got some. We're excited to have you here, and we're we let's get some things started with folks in chat. I want to give them a few instructions, and we're going to get to know you uh, just a little bit. So. Uh, first of all, uh, we'd love to have you put your top five in chat. So as you're logging in, just put your top five in there, throw it in there. We'll we'll highlight those as you bring them in. We'd love to know, just as a starter question, where are you today in in the workplace? Are you, um, are you, are, and maybe you never left, so you're fully at work. Have you gotten back full time? And is it is it a, are you home full time or working from home or working from a remote environment? Maybe. What is that for you? Or maybe it's a hybrid. We'd love to know that. And then we want to ask this question, what strength are you using? What do you think you're leaning into with your top five? What do you think you're using regardless of where you're at? Throw that in the chat room. Uh, Riley will bring those up as we go. Danny, let's get to know you a little bit. Tell us a little bit, for folks who don't know you, tell us a little bit about what you do for Gallup. Yeah, absolutely. So Gallup as an organization, if I were to really simplify, I would say we're an organization that studies human performance, human performance, what differentiates human performance. And at the aggregate level, then we'll also get interested in things like team performance. And then the team gets bigger. And then we're look study what makes some um, organizations, uh, what drives organizational performance. And I work, work with Gallup for now 15 years. And um, along that journey, um, I've worked in 20 different, uh, 20 different countries um, internationally, um, although I'm located in California here, uh, many times I'm outside of the U.S. And along that journey, I also work with three, about over 300 companies and organizations. But my role at Gallup is, um, is a coach. I'm a strengths coach, and I develop strengths coaches and work a lot with leaders. Um, and so far, about... I would count maybe a little bit over 3,500 leaders across uh, mm. the globe I'll work with. But a lot of times I engage with folks in the coaching space on a one-on-one -on -one space. So um, people do open up a lot, open up a lot to me about how they really feel about um, their life, their career, and their, um, and their workplaces. So I'm more of a strengths coach and strengths practitioner um, in that sense. Um, I'm not a researcher or a scientist by any stretch of, um, you know, imagination. Uh, my top five, um, Cliffs and Strengths wise, is I lead with individualization, empathy, connectedness, harmony, and uh, developer. Wow, that's great! Great, great to have you. I've been looking forward to this conversation um, for a while. Uh, a Ranger Wu Maximizer Communication Activator for me. Mm -hmm. Many of you are throwing that in the chat room. We'd love to continue to have you put your top five where you're listening from. We'd also kind of asking the question of what's your work environment? Are, are you hybrid? Are you in the office full time? Are you at home full time? Are you remote full time? What, what it, would you consider yourself in that? And then what strength are you using? Like if you think about your own top five, what are you using in this whatever work situation? What are you leaning into? Danny, let me ask you that question. Mm. How would you characterize your workplace and then what, what are you using uh, from your top five or even top 10, if you want to yeah, bring that in? Yeah, I would say before the, the pandemic, I would, yes, I did have an office. Yes, I did have a space in the office. But because I was traveling so much, I would probably categorize myself as almost like 99, 98, 99% remote. Mm. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And so now it's more like a hybrid where mostly I'm working from home, although I can go to the office, maybe 80% I'm spending time working from home, 20% uh, um, in the office. And um, business travel has picked up a little bit. So I did get to uh, travel international a little bit, uh, but not as much as I, uh, as I used to. So in this particular environment, I would say um, probably I'm exercising a lot, um, a, a lot of my individualization, um, exercising a lot of my connectedness, uh, continue to do meaningful work, um, but also kind of uh, keep an eye open for, you know, what's happening around the world and humanity and um, how do I continue to um, contribute in a way where the workplace environments and the environments within our client organizations are massively, uh, massively changing. Mm -hmm. um, I use a lot of my, it's in my top 10 adaptability, mm -hmm. um, as well. And my discipline. So I'll have a plan, 
but most likely I may not follow that plan. <laughs> and that's how, that's how I'm rolling these days. Yeah. Or you might have a couple plans. Like uh -huh. I, I find I have high adaptability as well. And I have mm -hmm. a couple plans. I can kind of move different, even these webcasts mm -hmm. while we have a plan in my brain, I have about 15 plans. Right. And it just is one of those kind of ways it works. I spent some time this morning with Jacqueline Robinson, Dr. Jacqueline mm -hmm. Robinson. We talked about yeah. adaptability and analytical from a well-being perspective. Mm. Let me, let me throw that question at, at you mm -hmm. right here. What, how are you staying in a, you know, in a situation where you're highly remote, mm -hmm. right, and, and and you're not necessarily going to office, how are you keeping your well-being high? What are you mm -hmm. doing personally to help with that, and how are you mm -hmm. leaning into that? Yeah, so I'm going to get a little bit geeky here um, because the you know I am a strengths coach. I do live and breathe a lot of this in, in this world of leaning into people's talent, and for my personal self, it's really looking at, because well-being, it's it's one word, but it's it means many different things to different people. Um, how we're wired talent-wise also gives some information about what gives us energy and what charges our energy where we feel like, oh, my well-being is in a good, uh, in a good place. So if you lead with, say, activator or achiever, then getting things done, getting to initiate things gives you energy and you feel more productive. Um, for myself, I'm more of a high connectedness uh, person. So having some quiet time, thinking time, making sense of things, what's happening around the world. And even when I'm working out and exercising, engaging in physical activities to keep myself um, um, healthy, it's more in tune with, um, it's less about, I'm going to beat my record. I'm going to beat my time. It's more about um, how, do, how, how can I run becoming more meditative? Mm. Um, how can I run and still become more peaceful? How can mm. I run and use that as a time to cleanse a lot of the kind of unnecessary clutter of thoughts that are within me and link those at well-being activities to my top five or my top 10? We're going to talk about improving teamwork, right, in these hybrid mm -hmm. environments. And I think it's important to start with self because yeah. it's tough to improve teamwork if you're struggling yourself Absolutely. right? Yeah. on that. And, and I love, boy, I, I would never would have put running and peaceful. I ran for a lot of years and mm -hmm. never put those two together. But great for you that you're trying to kind of reach that or, or, or find that point of how do we take these two activities and put them together to create a mm -hmm. great well-being environment for me? Lots yeah. of great comments are coming in on the chat room. I appreciate you. Riley's behind the scenes posting those. Mm. And uh, and we're using the power of two on that. Uh, Riley, I appreciate your work on that to get those up. Keep them coming in. Some great comments. We're seeing folks working full remote. We're, we're, we're seeing folks working hybrid. Some uh, have gone back in uh, to the workplace and, and are doing it full time from there. Danny, as we think about this idea then, improving teamwork, okay, mm -hmm. when we think about teamwork, we have this idea of four needs followers, right, coming mm -hmm. out of our strength-based leadership. Mm -hmm. Trust, stability, compassion, and hope are those. Mm -hmm. How do we, I think th th they're in that order on purpose, by the way, mm -hmm. in that idea of trust. As we think about reestablishing trust mm -hmm. in the workplace, in this hybrid environment, things have maybe been different. They've been different maybe for a while, or maybe they went, they they were the same, then different, then same, then different. They've been going back and forth, right? They've been hybrid, mm -hmm. whatever. What are some things we can do to kind of start building trust back into the workplace? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think when it comes to trust, it's, um, it's a word we all know, but building trust is so hard. I think um, it takes time. And trust is something that when you have it, you know, it's, it's almost like we take it for granted, but when we don't have that trust, it's hard to build. So how do we really build trust when, uh, from a place of, uh, of mistrust? And I think uh, when it comes to trust and collaboration, we have to go down to, it doesn't really matter whether it's hybrid or whether it's full-time getting together in, in person, trust is trust. So it's, it, it may differ how we tackle trust or build trust because we don't get to see each other one on one and we get don't get to like really sense each other's body languages and things like that. But uh, we're still human beings. So when we're building trust, um, I think one thing about trust is most of the time frequency matters. Frequent trust is not built through big events or one time this, okay, we're going to do this trust exercise. And it's all of a sudden like boom, built. Um, it's those many small, simple steps over time that builds um, trust. So even when we're thinking about, you know, what are those many little things that 
uh, that we need, um, being transparent and being transparent with higher frequency um, over time, that builds trust. Um, being care, um, care about the person. Um, and when you're making sense more caring comments, you're showing caring behavior, whether it's remotely or sending a text message or even um, recognizing small, you know, good behaviors in a, in a group meeting, um, that, builds, that builds care and do that more frequently over time. Um, listening, I think, is a big thing, building trust. Mm. Um, a lot of us in the workplace are so busy. Um, even in coaching, we say there's three level of listening. And a lot of time we're just listening at the level one. We listen to react. We listen to respond. Um, and um, even in a remote conversation setting, try to think about we're not, we're talking with each other and we're listening more rather than trying to talk to the person where you're taking up 80% of the airtime um, and barely giving the other person to speak uh, their mind. So um, gradually listening at a higher level and we do it frequently. Um, over time. Um, it doesn't have to be long conversation, but even in short conversation, how do I increase uh, more of the listening and build it into habits? Um, it's increasing the frequency of um, recognition, uh, increasing the frequency of um, empowering. So trust is kind of like, you can't build trust unless you're entrusting. And part of entrusting another person is by um, empowering them delegating them, um, setting clear expectations, but then enable them to uh, figure out ways to reach those outcomes in the way that's more natural uh, to them. Um, be more inquisitive about um, each other's differences and there's the strengths that they bring. Um, even Clifton Strengths, it's one in 33 million to meet somebody who's wired exactly the same as you are. So we all uh, wire differently, we have different batteries. So as we become more inquisitive um, and we increase that frequency, that will um, build trust um, over time. Whereas if we think about when we're so busy and we don't have room to do those frequency, let's say we're always listening at level one. Um, we are showing uncare like body behavior or body language or the way we speak with each other. Uh, if we're more self-oriented, we're only talking about my project or my needs or my performance, then over time, it's going to erode, um, erode trust. And um, uh, if we reduce because we're only remote, the trusting behaviors that we had in the mm, when we got to see each other, but now because we don't get to see each other, if we decrease that frequency and behavior, that's going to erode trust um, mm. over time. Uh, there's a lot of practical elements you just gave out there and a lot of great advice to be able to do that. I think um, one of those things, and you, you kind of just concluded with this, Brett mentions it in the chat room as well. Mm. He says two big tips that made a difference for me. It's thinking about this idea of just the fundamentals of communication, right? Mm -hmm. Turn off self view. So you're not staring at yourself on the camera, right? Yeah. And make the video screen smaller, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in some cases I've actually uh, insisted that's probably too strong of a word, but I really encourage folks to turn their video on. I want to see them and I want them to see me. I want to look mm -hmm. them in the eye. I want to have those frequent conversations. Um, I also, you know, there's a saying that email, no, that meeting should have been an email. Mm -hmm. I, I like to turn that around and say that email probably should have been a meeting because yes, we probably could have worked out that email. We probably could have done that work based on the email, but there's mm -hmm. no personal element to it, right? There's mm -hmm. no, there's no one-on-one -on -one building that trust, right? In that of of that communication, I think it's, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of key that we spend some time looking at each other, seeing mm -hmm. how we're responding, and then and then work together in that. Do you think anything else you'd add to that? Yeah. And I think it's about that balance too, right? Balance too. We have a lot of unproductive meetings where we're like, man, that should, that could have been an email. So um, it's less about having a meeting, but having a meaningful conversation, yeah. having a meaningful meeting, having a productive meeting where it builds on trust instead of eroding, um, eroding trust. Yeah. I love what you said about turning on the video cameras because 
um, it makes a huge difference. Um, when we're in person meeting someone, we wouldn't show up like, as Dean Jones would say, we wouldn't show up like with bag over our heads and have a meeting. Um, it makes the difference when you get to actually see the person and just even see their environment, their pets and kids. And, you know, it makes it makes it human. I think one thing that's really important about this hybrid virtual world is that um, it's not a computer experience. We have to make it a human um, experience. And the more we make it comfortable for them to interact with us, uh, the more conversation where people are less talking to us, but talking with us. A couple good questions coming out of the chat room. Uh, one, I read that managers want to go back to the office more than contributors. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? I, I don't know if we have data that specific, mm. but so, some, some ideas around that. Yeah. Um, Jim, can you elaborate that question a little bit? I don't think I understand the question. Yeah. So in other words, managers, you know, the, the, the remote work concept was difficult. I think most difficult for man, a lot of managers, cause they mm. lost track. They felt like they were going to lose track mm. of those that they were, they were managing, right? If I can't mm. see you, I can't manage you. Yeah. We, during, during COVID, during this time where more people work remotely, not everybody could, by the way, there was mm -hmm. a whole group of people and thank you to yeah. those workers who, did went in to do because oftentimes they did things that 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 helped us right so thank you if you mm -hmm. continue to work in the workplace when you did that but um so there was this idea of command and control i think that's what this question's getting mm -hmm. to where managers were get, lost a little bit lost or felt like they would lose a little bit of productivity or that communication so danny as we think about that i think we've learned a lot about that maybe that maybe isn't true how mm -hmm. can managers still in, in this hybrid environment, how, they, how can they still continue to provide? You gave a clue to this just a minute ago when you talked about recognition, mm -hmm. but are other things managers can do to kind of continue to create that communication and, and make sure they're not losing track of people? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question, by the way, is um, I think human needs are consistent pre-pandemic, during pandemic, or even after post-pandemic, the human needs are the basically it's consistent. But how we meet those needs are going to be uh, to be different. Um, pre-pandemic, people wanted to be developed. Uh, that's just a general need in the workplace. Um, and during pandemic, the same. Post-pandemic, it's going to be the same. Uh, people like to be recognized. People need to have their, uh, they like to have priorities. They like to have clarity on expectations. Um, they like to be able to utilize their strengths in their workplaces. Um, they like to be cared for. They want to be doing meaningful work. So those will stay quite consistent. Um, now the challenge is figuring out how we can tap into those um, needs in a way that it's more virtual, um, you know, if it's a hybrid um, case. So before we knew how to do that. Well, not everybody did, uh, the reality is, but the good managers knew how to do that, knew how to do that in person. Now we have to figure out how to do that in a more uh, remote case. So um, before, it, if, if it was a, kind of like an in-person, um, having a lot of infrequent chats, uh, we'll have to find ways to do that more virtually through text messaging or instant messaging or um, just frequent ongoing conversations we're having with vid video meetings. I think one thing before prior um, the virtual world was there was a meeting. There was a 30 minute block of the meeting. There was start of the meeting and the end of the meeting. And there was like this, we're thinking meetings in terms of these time units. It's either a 30 minute meeting, 45 minute meeting or a 60 minute meeting. Um, whereas now it's more, those time blocks are kind of going away. There's mm -hmm. five minute video chats, eight minute video chats, you know, 13 minutes. So we're having more smaller infrequent conversations or touch points. And at the end, I think from an employee's point of view, we want them engaged. We want them to be in a state where they feel like they're doing meaningful work. They're being productive and uh, performing at an optimal level um, and staying, staying engaged. And I think one important component to that is um, when an employee feels like the manager really gets them, they really understood, manager really gets them. That's a huge, I think, differentiator. So in this environment, how do we continue to show that care um, and specificity as a manager 
to keep the employee engaged. Whereas mm -hmm. when the employee starts feeling like oh, the manager doesn't really get me, manager doesn't understand, then that's where engagement starts dropping and those um, trust starts getting um, eroded. Mm -hmm. At the end, the right answer, it, it all depends, right? It all depends. But then we have to think about um, what is the actual outcome that we are pursuing and how do we get there more optimally? And there's going to be a lot more creativity, I think, involved that will be required to individualize and, and customize. Because as you mentioned, some got to work remotely. Some got to sort of survive, but not really thrive in the virtual working environment. Mm -hmm. So just because we have done it doesn't mean we were optimized. Some are optimized. We were really optimized where productivity actually went up. Um, some productively, the reality went down, but because that was the only option, we basically survived. Yeah. 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 Megan I asked a great question kind of related to that. She says, doesn't being virtual help some introverts and those who get distracted by behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. this played into some people's strengths where maybe it hadn't happened before. Some can listen better by controlling their environments. And, and I think that really speaks to for some, it, and you just said this, for some, it got better. For others, mm -hmm. it was worse. I think from a mm -hmm. manager's standpoint, we need to know that, <laughs> right? And you don't know that unless you're having conversations. We know from our data that that what people are looking for are mm -hmm. a, a one weekly coaching conversation from their manager. And I, it doesn't have to, when I think we think of a coaching conversation, it doesn't need to be that organized, structured mm -hmm. coaching conversation. True. Danny, when we think of some, conversations that can happen weekly that are coaching related, what, what did those look like or what mm -hmm. kind of advice can we give on that? Yeah. So coaching to really both born. I mean, coaching means different things to the people. Sometimes coaching means like, man, let me coach you. I'm going to coach you right now. Like, you listen to me. I'm going to coach you. So there's that coaching, but then there's the, the pure sense of um, sense of coaching. So if we really simplify what coaching is, it's an activity where we are helping the client or helping an employee expand their thinking. It's a way to develop. And coaching is, it's different from a consulting conversation where consulting is more, it's consulting is more, here's the issue, here's what you need to do. We're telling them what to do. But that actually does narrow a person's thinking possibilities because here's the right answer. You got to follow the right um, direction. Whereas coaching is more in the long run, help the, um, employee and the team member grow, mm -hmm. think more creatively, mm -hmm. um, and become, take more ownership in their path of development and problem, uh, problem resolution. And coaching does not, as you mentioned, have to be a one hour conversation or a 30 minute conversation. Coaching happens all the time. Um, I can even, I even call it undercover coaching where we can have a uh, five or six minutes like coffee conversation. But if I'm really listening at a higher level and asking good questions to expand their thinking, the employee, they think, they feel heard and they get more engaged. And they, at the end of the conversation, they're actually taking more ownership in, um, in the issue or the topic or the project because they are the ones who got to process out loud and think out loud uh, with the managers um, support. So um, the weekly ongoing coaching conversation is highly um, encouraged, but it doesn't have to be formal calendar uh, mm -hmm. driven ones. It's the casual one on one that happens. Um, and I had mentioned this earlier, Megan says, you know, we we're talking about folks who didn't go remote, right? Groceries, delivery. Think mm -hmm. about think about all those delivery companies. These are US based, but think about those doctors, nurses, emergency responders, endless thanks. And we sometimes we came up with a lot of solutions for remote, but they're still like, I, can we take these these remote ideas, quick phone calls, quick video sessions, whatever, and apply those backwards in to to in person? Right. That's that still applies. Right. I still can just have a quick conversation that maybe a quick five minute coaching conversation that's done in person. Still, that's still mm -hmm. allowed. Right. That can still happen. Is exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. So I think overall, the human needs stay quite consistent. Mm -hmm. But how we meet those needs, uh, we just need to be a little bit more creative and be comfortable with uncomfortable because not everybody 
is comfortable with video chatting or even text messaging. They're more, yeah. it's just like in the, when we went virtual, when I'm engaging in coaching conversation, there's basically, there's people who are like going nuts because they can't meet people and they're stuck in their rooms. Um, and then there we have a, a group of people I'm talking with and they're like, you know what? I kind of dig this. Like, I like this. <laughs> like the fact yeah. that I don't have to like do all those handshakes and meeting people in the small chats and, you know, having more uh, focus time, you right. know, talked about the introverts or, but it's not always about the introvert versus the expert, but even how we're wired talently. Yeah. I have woo in communication very, very high. And I had people mm -hmm. call me the first several weeks and say, are you okay? Like, yeah. are you going to be okay? And I actually discovered through that time, I liked the more, the, the, the quiet, I liked the focused time. I liked that ability. I kind of leaned into it. Ever later, uh, eight as well, and so I was mm -hmm. I was able to pull some of that in to meet with people one on one to do that. Danny, I love in the in the in the, in the next five minutes. Or so I love the the first three questions of our Q twelve framework to be help mm -hmm. managers with some of these conversations to individualize them because this is what I heard you say. Managers still have to have individual communication or individual expectation setting with their teams if we want to improve mm -hmm. teamwork. Managers need to spend some time getting to know their team. Q1, I know it's expected of me. Q2, I have everything I need to do the job that, I, that I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do. And three, I'm, I get to do what I do best every day. Mm -hmm. how, how, as we think about those three questions in there, how would you help managers frame that up in a way so that everyone's voices can be heard in mm -hmm. that? How would you use that framework? Can you talk, give us a few yeah. minutes on that? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, I mean, you're absolutely right. Those first three dimensions, it's also very, very connected to human needs too. Like if I'm working, if there's 27 projects happening and if the manager says all 27 are important, you can't drop the ball, may the force be with you. Then although the expectation is rationally clear, emotionally, it's very confusing. So we had that we have that need to be able to um, to focus. So one thing as managers we can do is get into even thinking about not just higher level of listening, but even being empathetic. How is my message going to land in their space? Um, how can I make it feel more simplified? How can I help them prioritize so that yes, we're busy, but among those, there has to be a way that we can help them prioritize so they have their working with a sense of um, clarity. And that's what we see in high performing team versus average too. High performing teams, busy. Average team, also very busy, equally busy. But what we find different is the high performing team because their clarity on what's important and what's not, all of those work goes more towards the priorities versus the average team there's duplications, there's, you know, balls being dropped, there's gaps, there's a lot of confusion. And a lot of times the, the energy goes towards what's less important versus going to what is, uh, what is more important. Mm -hmm. So help employees um, prioritize and align expectations because we see a lot that too, where uh, managers expectations and team members expectations are misaligned or team members' expectations are also misaligned um, as well. Um, going to the materials and equipment, what do they need? Um, oftentimes, it may not necessarily be the tangible equipments. It might be insights. It might be information. It might be heads up. It might be um, the right partner to um, tackle a particular issue or lead a project, that those complementary partnerships. So broaden the definitions of materials and equipment and resources. And through those frequent check-ins with the employees and team members, uh, make sure we are we understand and giving each other um, support in a team uh, team setting. Um, can can I cover number three? Yeah, absolutely. It's getting to do what I do best every day. Uh, we, we've got a you know strengths are the key to that. That's really in our yeah. Q twelve where strengths enter in, and we've got a great opportunity with that. Um, during this season, if you're listening to this live or over the next couple of weeks, we are offering, we have a special gift. Uh, if you, if you head out and you purchase five, all 34 codes for maybe a team, it'd be perfect for a team gift, right? Managers, if you want to know the strengths and all get a, get an all 34 report, 34% off if you use gift 34. So all caps, G I F T 34 as you're purchasing those, 
you'll get 34 34% off those coats. We like that number 34. So we, we thought we'd give that a try as well. If you want to do that, that'll work, I think, till December 9th, uh, 2021. So you can check that out as well. But that's it gives the managers, Danny, I think a great framework, right? If we want to improve teamwork, we have to understand who the people are. And I think exactly. strengths is one of those dimensions that as manager or as a team, we kind of understand each other. We kind of understand where we're coming from and what we're doing. And certainly having Clifton Strengths as a tool to be able to do that is is great. Uh, our, our time is up, but I want to give you a one more minute. Any other final thoughts, Danny, as we wrap our time? Together? Yeah, I'll just um, in, just enhance what you just said. A great team is like the Avengers. They're, they're not, everybody's not like Incredible Hulk. They're all very, very different. And we can see when we don't understand those differences, those superheroes just fighting against each other. But when we understand how people bring different talents and skill sets and knowledge and strengths to the team, then we can build a better way of collaborating and optimizing um, the team. Uh, I think those are good words. We have a resource for you as well. If you go to gallup.com and search for improve, improving teamwork, we have a whole page that we've put together with got some ideas and stuff. You can spend some time on it. We want to thank you, Danny. Thank you for joining thank me. Thank you. It's a today. pleasure. I want to thank the chat room. Lots of great info in the chat as well. We want to thank you for joining us today. We all have plenty more of these available for you on LinkedIn. If you follow our page, Clifton Strengths, um, some great opportunities for, to do. And I've got some great topics coming up here in the future as well. Thanks for coming out to, uh, today. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.